I'm so happy to be here in this amazing company of ambassadors, distinguished experts, guests, fellow elected officials, and everyone also listening, not the least all my friends at UN Watch. So thank you so much. And as you said, we are gathered in Geneva, a city that is long been known for as a place of refuge and reform, but also intense sectarian strife. And a city which for more than 100 years has symbolized the dream of peace among all people. We are gathered on the margins of the Human Rights Council with Secretary General Guterres just next door, together with many ministers attending. What do you think they will talk about in 2024? What will they say about Israel, about Hamas, about terrorism, about peace. And thanks in large part to the essential work of UN Watch, we know that the Human Rights Council's history of resolutions against the State of Israel, more than against all other countries combined, year after year, even as it itself now includes repressive authoritarian members like China and Cuba, just to name two others. Of course, there are also other members with different values. Israel has no better friend than the United States, represented here by distinguished members of Congress from both major parties. Today I speak to you as a Jew, as a Swede, as a human being, and as a Christian Democrat in the European Parliament. So what do I see as the path to peace, and specifically about the role of UNRWA? As I said in October, from the floor to the European Parliament, from the river to the sea, all hostages must be free. This include all those in Gaza held hostage for years by Hamas as well. So how has Hamas held Gaza captive? We have known about their brutality for many years now, but they have in part also been let off the hook of good governance by the very United Nations agency tasked with meeting the needs of 1948 Palestinian refugees. As the scope and size of that agency has grown over the decades, Hamas hasn't really needed to fully govern in Gaza, hasn't needed to spark sustainable growth or heal the sick or provide proper schools for children. They could focus instead on terrorism and torture, starting with Gazans themselves. UNRWA, to a large extent, would run the hospital and teach the kids. So what was UNRWA teaching them? Throughout my mandate, I have expressed my deepest distress over the issue of Palestinian textbooks, including some used in UNRWA schools filled with messages of hate, anti-Semitism and incitement to violence and jihad against the Jewish people and the state of Israel. Textbooks bought with EU taxpayers' money. I have repeatedly and directly called on the European Commission to account for this and to stop it. My, the EU is UNRWA's third biggest donor not counting EU member state funding, my own country of Sweden comes forth. But Sweden as well has now suspended its contributions and the European Commission is conducting a review. Why? Two weeks ago, in a joint meeting of the European Parliament's Foreign Affairs and Budget Committees, I challenged UNRWA's Europe Director over credible recent reports alleging several UNRWA staff actively participated in the horrible terror attacks of October 7th, with even more celebrating those attacks in a group chat, and as, as many as 1,200 employees actually members of Hamas or Islamic Jihad. This in addition to reports of Hamas tunnels powered by UNRWA electricity underneath UNRWA's Gaza headquarters. So it is time to conclude. UNRWA has failed in Gaza, has failed Gazans. The people of Gaza need food and clean water and shelter, schools fostering respect and peace, not an organization whose staffers pour fuel on the fire of conflict and even join in acts of terrorism. No organization is irreplaceable. So what to do? In the aftermath of October 7th, the EU quadrupled its 2023 Palestinian aid. For 2024, this will go up by yet another factor. In Gaza, this EU aid cannot go through the UNRWA, but to other organizations which have proven their greater responsibility and, not the least important, objectivity. And in the medium and long term, the EU must work together with transatlantic partners like the United States, Canada, United Kingdom, but also with regional partners like Jordan, Egypt, and the signatories of the breakthrough 2020 Abraham Accords to create the conditions for a viable two-state solution in the Middle East. That would guarantee Israel's security and it would ensure dignity and self-determination of the Palestinian people. This joint effort must first involve security on the ground in Gaza, after Hamas is defeated. It must also take the lead in providing for Gazans humanitarian needs. The resources are there. 
if there is a will. October 7th was a dark day, and every day since, for Israelis as well as for Palestinians. It is a time for a new day to dawn, with new ideas, new partners, for peace. Thank you. <laughs>